Hey, Seraphin here, and today we're making the Japanese melon pan. Melon pan, literally melon bread, is generally known as a round bun with cookie dough on top covered in a crisscross pattern. But while this shape is more popular, there is actually another type of melon pan, especially well known in the west of Japan, like in the city of Kobe. There, the melon pan doesn't refer to the round bun; it actually refers to this spindle-shaped bun, with the round one being called sunrise buns. Until now, the exact origin of both of these cookie-topped breads remains relatively obscure. Many have observed its incredible similarity to the Mexican conchas bread, which has been referenced in the creation of the Malaysian roti boy and Hong Kong's pineapple bread, which, by the way, are quite similar in their concept, although different in the exact details. With the Japanese melon pan, though, I have yet to find any concrete historical connections between the concha and the melon pan. Some believe the melon pan was developed independently, with many sites stating that an Armenian baker in Japan invented it. Although there are also many other stories of its origin. Since the bread doesn't traditionally contain melon or use melon in any way, the name melon pan is generally thought to refer to the appearance of the bun, the lines making it resemble a musk melon. There's also some who suggest that the melon of the melon pan was actually derived from meringue. But this idea stands on shaky grounds, with little evidence for it. As for why many people in Western Japan called the round melon pan sunrise and instead call the spindle-shaped bun melon pan, it seems to be related to one bakery inventing sunrise bread. It said they called it sunrise because the cookie dough on top was marked with radial lines imitating the rising sun flag. As the story goes, from there it became increasingly popular to line the cookie dough in a similar way. And since a mold of the radial lines was difficult to attain, it was changed into the more convenient and now familiar grid pattern, which eventually came to be known as melon pan. That would certainly explain where the name of the sunrise bread came from, and the spindle-shaped melon pan is said to have been developed later on in the western part of Japan, where it got popular. And so, until now, in those areas, melon pan is known as the oval-shaped bun, and sunrise is the round one. All right, I will conclude by saying that naturally, further historical details and the absolute accuracy of these origins are beyond our scope of research. Instead, we're going to focus on how to make the melon pan. The first thing we need to do is make the tangjong. So we've got everything set up here, ready to start. We just took our kettle off its base plate, and now we want to measure in 85 grams of boiling hot water into the mixing bowl. We follow that up by immediately adding 50 grams of flour into the bowl, taking that off the scale, and immediately mixing it all together with our wooden rolling pin. You may have noticed that this is a little over a three to two water to flour ratio, which, as I've explained before, exceeds the amount of water required for starch gelatinization. And as long as we hydrate the flour quickly before the temperature drops far below 65 degrees Celsius, there shouldn't be an issue. And when we don't see any more of the loose flour scattered around, the tangjong is almost done. And we'll clean it off with a spatula. A final tap down, and we put the spatula away for now. We cover the bowl with a silicone cap, stretching it over, and we're good. We'll leave this out at room temperature for a while before putting it in the fridge to rest overnight. Now we need to make the poolish. We have a hundred grams of water, an eighth of a teaspoon of instant yeast, or about zero point six grams, and a hundred grams of bread flour. All ready and measured out, we're now going to put them into this nice glass in the order I mentioned. This ensures the liquids go in first and prevents clumps of flour at the bottom. Then it's time to mix it well with our chopsticks, our favorite tool to use when making poolish. For me, this step usually takes less than 30 seconds to fully hydrate the flour. Very convenient. With that, we just clean off our chopsticks and then we cover the glass. We want to let this ferment for around an hour at 28 degrees Celsius. After which, this poolish is off to the fridge for the night, alongside the tangjong to slow down fermentation and develop more flavor. Right, it's been a day since we made the tangjong and poolish, and both of them are ready. 
we can finally make our final dough. We'll uncover the two containers for our poolish and tangchong, and then getting right into it using a spatula, we dislodge the poolish from the glass and into our stand mixer's bowl. It's a little sticky as you can see, and it's very extensible. We'll clean the glass up, picking up all the loose bits and adding them in. Moving right along to our tangchong, it's become very cold and stiff overnight. We just pick the bowl up, scoop up that lump of flour and water, cleaning the bowl with our spatula. Okay, liquids next, which is 45 grams of fresh milk, pouring it right in. Then we cast in 40 grams of sugar. Following that, we add four grams of salt, brushing it all in from the plate. Penultimate ingredient, an eighth of a teaspoon of instant yeast, about 0 0.6 grams, tossing it all in. Finally, 150 grams of bread flour. Like I said before, flour lasts to prevent clumps, just getting it all in. I will now give that a good mix with the spatula, not aiming for anything cohesive, much less smooth here. We just don't want the dry flour to go flying when we put it in our stand mixer. We then clean the spatula off with our scraper, just firmly getting off any dough on both sides of the spatula. We put them away and we still have one ingredient we haven't added yet, which is 25 grams of butter. We're gonna mix the dough for a few minutes before we throw it in. So we'll put the bowl in the mixer here with the dough hook attachment already in place. We'll lower it and then start the machine. We want to let this run for five minutes on medium high. The dough looks really dry at first because of the cold tang chong and poolish. Don't worry and definitely don't add water if this is what you see, it will rapidly come together. Give it another minute or two and the dough will start looking like this round in a ball, and the bold sides will be a lot cleaner. This looks like enough mixing for this stage. It's already been five minutes, so we wanna stop the mixer, pull up the dough hook. Let's add in the 25 grams of butter now. It's been left out to soften, so we can just drop it in with our spatula. Then we bring the dough hook back down and start the mixer again. Back to medium high, we have another six to seven minutes of mixing ahead of us. Okay, while we're waiting for the dough, let's just get into the science of the ingredients. The first thing to know about this recipe is that it makes a sweet dough. We add 16% sugar, baker's percentage to the dough. And while this is much higher than the 6% we normally use, it's still somewhat lower than many Asian sweet breads that can have percentages of sugar going up to 25 to 30% or even more. To be honest, that's too sweet for our taste, so we lowered it. When recipes get into this range of sugar addition, the yeast can go from enjoying all the extra food to having severe difficulty due to the osmotic stress caused by the sugar. The yeast can eventually thrive in such osmotic stress by stocking up on glycerol and tree halos, which help to protect them from this stress. But this can take some time. There can be a long lag phase before they're up to producing carbon dioxide at an acceptable rate. In the worst case scenario, this could result in an extremely long fermentation period. To combat this, there are some special kinds of instant yeast on the market called osmotolerant yeast. These strands of yeast are far better at surviving and thriving in these conditions. That being said, the 16% of sugar we added isn't really enough to cause such drastic effects, and you don't need osmotolerant yeast for this recipe. The fermentation periods are a little longer, but not unacceptably so. In such a sweet dough recipe, we naturally also have milk to help complement the flavor. Improvements in bread elasticity, chewiness, and resilience were shown when adding milk to replace under 25% of the water. So that's how much we cap our amount of milk at. To quote from this paper, breadcrumb presented higher firmness, lower volume, and porosity for samples with dairy ingredients compared to the control. Therefore, replacement levels lower than 25% were recommended in order to minimize this negative effect. The paper also reported that higher maximum gelatinization temperatures were obtained when milk was used instead of water, which definitely has some effect on the oven spring, and it could also affect the tangchong if we used milk while making it. 
but we didn't, so we don't need to worry about that. Like we said, we also limited the amount of milk in the bread dough, so the effects aren't going to be as drastic. That was sugar and milk. We'll now talk about the fat. The total fat content of this recipe, including in the butter and milk, is about 8-9% to baker's percentage, which is at the upper end of the recommended range for softer buns. The volume may not be as high as it could be ideally, but the fat will make up for it by tenderizing the bread, and along with the tangzheng, will increase its shelf life significantly. The addition of the butter here will cause it to look like a bit of a mess. It comes together very quickly though, and following that, we're just kneading the dough until it looks shiny and smooth with clean sides all around it. Cold dough and dough with tangzheng do take longer to mix, so we're being patient with this dough. After seven more minutes of mixing, here's how the dough looks. It's pretty much done at this point, smooth and round, with a pretty clean bowl, so we're going to stop the mixer. We'll pull up the dough hook, and the dough looks nice and strong. This type of gluten development is a pretty sure sign that it's good to continue, so we're just going to move on. We get the dough off the dough hook using our scraper to clean it off if we need to. We then take out the bowl and move it to our table. We're next going to oil our hands and a glass bowl for the dough to rest in. Don't need much oil, just enough for a thin layer to prevent sticking. We make sure to spread it all over the bowl and our hands. And let me just show you briefly what the window pane test of this dough should look like. It should be able to get this thin as long as you spread it out gently without tugging too hard. This is a pretty extensible dough, and if you can't get this result without the dough ripping, that could be a sign that your dough hasn't been kneaded for long enough. Okay, with that done, it's time to get the dough out of the mixing bowl with our scraper. Just get all of the dough out, then pick up any dough left, putting the bowl aside. Keeping it in our hands, we now tuck and shape the dough into a round ball, quick and simple, with a nice smooth skin on top. And we're going to put the dough into the bowl we just lined. Okay, we cover the bowl and leave the dough to bulk ferment for about an hour and a half at 28 degrees Celsius. We're aiming for the dough to roughly double in size, and like we mentioned, since this is a sweet dough recipe, it's a little slower than usual. While we let the dough ferment, we're going to make the cookie dough for our metal bun. Here are all the ingredients we need. In the main mixing bowl, we have 70 grams of unsalted butter, already softened. To it, we directly add 70 grams of powdered sugar, just patting it in. Then we bring in about a teaspoon of lemon juice. This helps to add some more depth of flavor to the cookie. We're also adding a bit of lemon zest, grating it in straight from the rind. Not too much, it's just there to give the cookie a bit of an oomph. And after that, before we add in any more ingredients, we want to cream the butter, sugar, and lemon together until they become homogenous, light, and fluffy with the whisk. It might take a few seconds at first because the mixture is a bit clumpy, but it should eventually spread out easily. You just want to keep whisking it and mixing everything together. After about three to four minutes of whisking, you can see that the color is very pale, it's light and it's fluffy, the sugar is mostly dissolved, so we're going to stop and add 50 grams of a whole egg. Pour it in, getting every drop, and we're back to whisking the mixture. It'll be a very liquid mess at first. The butter will kind of slide in the egg, but as long as we keep mixing, beating that egg into the butter, it will quickly start to come together. It gets stiffer as you mix it, and it will eventually blend into this gorgeous cream. The whisking here looks so dramatic in the video, but it's not that much elbow grease, really. I just wanted to get it done quickly, which it pretty much is here. We'll tap the whisk on the bowl's edge to detach any of the butter mix sticking to it. Then put the whisk aside and we're going to throw in 180 grams of all-purpose flour, flipping the bowl over and tapping it in. Following that, we're going to use a spatula just to combine everything. It looks like a little too much for the bowl right now, but trust me, it's the right size. 
And after about another minute, this is basically done. Everything looks pretty well combined. At this point, we're just cleaning up the sides and double checking for any flower hanging around. It looks good, so we'll move on to the next step. Now we're going to divide the dough into two using a scale to make sure we're accurate. We're making two cookie toppings after all, one original and the other matcha. And if you're not using matcha, then you can skip this step, going to the next one directly. When we're done dividing and measuring the dough, we'll toss in three grams of matcha powder to one half of it. Getting all of it in. And we fold the matcha in with the spatula as well. It should only take a few minutes before the matcha is completely combined into the dough. And this is how it'll look. Lovely dark green, it's fantastic. We just pat it down and set it aside. Now we're going to wrap the dough to store it. We spread the plastic sheet out on the work surface, and then with a new spatula to prevent the color from spreading, we drop the dough out onto one side of the plastic. Then we wanna cover and roll it into a log. So we start by folding the edge of the sheet over, and then we'll gently roll it all the way. No pressing too hard or squishing it. Neat and tidy. After that, we tuck the sides in, fold them over, and we set this log of dough aside for now. We'll be repeating the same thing for the matcha dough with a new plastic sheet, of course. So we turn the dough out, tipping it over onto the plastic, rearranging the sheet if we need to, then fold the edge over and flatten a little bit to get it to settle in, after which we roll it into the plastic gently again, going all the way to the end. Then we'll fold in the edges neatly, tucking them under, and here we have both cookie doughs wrapped well and ready to go into the fridge to cool. It's important for these doughs to be at a low temperature when we shape our meron pan later, largely because they're made with a fair amount of butter, and butter has a very specific temperature range where it's smooth, pliable, and very easy to work with. The room temperature here is normally way above that temperature, which leads to the dough looking like this. Soft and squishy, very malleable, and if I tried to handle this directly, it would melt a little, so off to the fridge they go. On the work surface now, the dough is done with its bulk fermentation. Here's how it looks, filled with gas and roughly double in size. We'll dust our work surface with flour, as well as the top of our dough. This dough can be quite sticky, so to stay on the safe side, I'm adding a bit more flour. We'll punch down to degas it a little. And after that, we take it out of the bowl, and we're gonna knead it a bit more to further degas it and roughly shape it into a round bowl. We'll weigh the whole thing then, because we want to divide it into six equal pieces. Each one should be around 83 to 84 grams. We'll just divide it all first, before we make sure all the pieces are an equal amount. Once all the doughs are equal, we're going to pre-shape them. Now, we use a bit of flour to prevent sticking. We're going to tuck the dough into the center, and then roll it in our palms, moving fast and not making the dough too tight. I'll rearrange them to the side now, lining them up in the order that I made them in, from left to right. Then I'll cover them, leaving them to bench rest for 15 minutes. While the dough rests, we'll take out our cookie dough and divide and pre-shape it too. Starting with the original cookie dough, we want to divide it into three. 
it's cold now, so it's a little more difficult to cut into. Got to press down a bit. And we're also using a scale to make sure we divide them accurately. Measurement done, we take a piece and just round it in our hands before placing it in a glass dish to the side. If it's still cold, this may be a little difficult and you might need to warm it up in your hands. With these three already done, smooth and round, we want to repeat the same thing with the matcha dough. Unwrapping the plastic, cutting it into three with a scraper, and then weighing it. This dough has spent more time outside the fridge, so it's easier to cut into and divide. Shaping it is also much easier, though the butter is melting a little in my hands, so I'm trying to work fast. When they're all on the dish, we cover it, and it goes off to the fridge again while we get ready to work with the dough. So the bench rest is done, and now we're shaping the dough. With a bit more flour to dust the work surface, we take a piece of the dough, flip it over, coating it well with flour to prevent sticking, and pat it down to fully degas it, preventing any large holes in the crumb. Then we tuck the edges into the center to form a round and tight ball, using our hand to round it out further. That was the first one. Here's the second, third, and the fourth. For the last two, we're actually gonna make them in imitation of the spindle-shaped metal bun. It's still the same thing in the beginning after dusting the surface. We coat the dough with flour as usual, flip it, and we're still degassing it in the same way to get rid of those large bubbles thoroughly and then tucking it in the same manner. But then we fold it over and roll it out, a bit like making a baguette, but we're not putting as much effort into getting it super long. The shape becomes a sort of longer batard. With them all done, we'll get out the cookie dough balls and covering them. To shape these, we take one from the glass dish, place it on the plastic sheet, flattening it a little, before folding a sheet over and rolling it with our rolling pin to spread it out so that we can cover our dough with it. Once it's wide enough, we uncover one side and place the dough down onto it. Then we press the dough in, flipping it over, before we take the sheet off the topping. Here I'm just making sure it sticks to the dough well, rolling it around a little bit, trying to move fast to prevent the topping from getting too warm. After that, we've got a bowl of sugar and I'm just dipping it in, coating all sides of the topping, rolling it around. The sugar makes it look a lot better looking and we finish it off by using a scraper to mark that lattice pattern on the dough. This is a really fun part of the process. When that's done, it goes onto our baking tray lined with a silicone baking mat. And with one down, we've got five more to go. So we just move on directly to the next one. And here's the second melon. It's just the same thing as before, nothing special. This one is a metal bun inspired by the spindle-shaped bun, so there's no lattice pattern here. We're just running lines through the length with our scraper. No less beautiful than the other pattern in my opinion, and it somewhat reminds me of a cacao bean. 
Now we do our matcha cookie toppings, and I really should have run to freeze these for a bit because they were already quite warm, still cool, but rapidly approaching room temperature. That's why they don't look as smooth and nice. When we're done, we're going to cover all these gorgeous melon bands with a plastic sheet and double that with a layer of cloth above it to fully cover them. Then we want to leave them to proof for one hour. We set aside enough time before the dough is done to preheat the oven to 180 degrees Celsius. The timing and temperature setting can vary depending on the type of oven you have, so make sure to adjust to your oven accordingly. All right, the dough is done proofing. We uncover them and here's how they look. Notice how the dough has expanded and the topping has broken apart according to the lines we made. We now bake them for 15 minutes at 180 degrees Celsius, top and bottom heat. And they're done. Don't they just look beautiful, so appetizing, and they taste just as good as they look. The topping is a bit difficult to work with, especially in tropical climates, but it's overall not too hard, and the end result is lovely. The taste of the cookie blends perfectly with the taste of the bread, resulting in an ultimate comfort food, so enjoyable and decadent. Probably not something I'd eat every single day, but I would absolutely savor this every time I had it, which is what I'm going to do right now. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching and bye!